I'll take days off, do I? Do I? When my number is called, I don't take plays off, do I? Do I? I'ma always give you 20 and 10. No matter how much you wanna pretend that I ain't clutch with it. I don't do the low management. Maybe I can handle it. When the heat is on, I can manage it. I'm kinda like James Harden's career. I can walk whenever I What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Others Receiving Votes podcast, sponsored by M Glow. Market, connect, play. I'm your host, Lauren Woods, a.k.a. Big Low. And I'm sitting here, man, well, one, I'm sitting here annoyed, annoyed as hell, because I swear these dudes with the leaf blowers, like they rolled through the crib like every other day. And I'm like, yo, it's not even like leaves don't even fall off the trees like that. In the springtime. One, I don't even remember ever seeing a leaf blower do in the Midwest. I'm from, I'm from St. Louis, and I, I don't remember ever seeing one in the Midwest. If I did, maybe it was like once every two months or something like that. I swear, these dudes out here on the West Coast, they be out every day making me mad. That shit is so annoying, to be honest with you. But um, I guess that's not really what I want to talk about. What I really want to talk about is... Um, Back when I was in college, I was sitting here thinking about that. And I remember uh, when I got injured, uh, it was like my junior year, I got injured at the, uh, at the end of my junior year. And that year I was for sure going uh, pro. I, I don't know if I was even going to get picked or not, but I had stopped going to class. I had, man, I had a stack of books in the plastic in my apartment, like stacked up. Um, up against the wall. It was looking crazy. I was using it like a, like a nightstand. I was putting stuff on, on them books and everything. It was <laughs> coasters and all that. It was, it was, it was unbelievable. Um, but then I got injured and, uh, I remember like, I, you know, I still had consulted with a, with a few people to ask them if they thought I would still get picked. And, um, you know, it was, it was kind of like mixed reviews or whatever, but, Bottom line is I decided that it would be best if I went back to school. Now, I went back to, to all my teachers because my they hadn't seen me that entire semester. Like I got injured around like like the end of February, beginning of March. Like they hadn't said, you know, it's only five months of, of a semester. They hadn't seen me since maybe Jan. I think I might have went the first day. Uh, that's it. And then I, I was done with school. It was a rap ski. I, I never really liked school to begin with. Um probably since like the third grade. It's, it's just, it's just not my, my jam. You know what it is? Some things, some people, it, they like school. Me, I was not, I was more of a not school type person. But at any rate, um, I, I went to back, went back to my teachers and I'm like, yeah, so, oh, uh, I'm going to need to take these classes, um, and pass them. And I had like all zeros. It, I'm not even talking about like regular F's. You know, like a regular F is if you kind of, some people just don't get the material. So they might get like a 50 or 60% F. Uh, some people might miss a few assignments, but it wasn't that many assignments to begin with. So maybe like 40% F. Some people, you know, borderline 70% or no, I guess back then, like the grading scale was like 60% was a, 61% was a D, I think 59%. Might have been an F or maybe something, like, but mine was zeros, like zero, 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 zero. Forget about that. Like teachers was just like, yo, you might as well just forget about it. Like, don't even think about it. And I remember how difficult um, it was for me to to come to the re- realization that I might be done, period, with school and not like, um, I, you know, I was injured. So it wasn't like I had a plan to fall back on. I thought my life was over. My career, I thought my career was over. I thought my life was over. I thought it was the end. And that was when I was like about 21 years old. And, you know, just like most 21 year olds, um, they're dumb. Uh, pretty much all of them are dumb. I was dumb when I was 21. Everybody's dumb when they're 21. We, you know, we all think we know everything and we don't know, know anything, to be honest with you. But uh, we're still learning and I was still learning. But I just thought that my, my life was over when I got injured and then when I went back to school to, to try to, to re-enroll and take all the classes and my teacher was like, you might as well chalk it up. It's not happening. Um, but, uh, and I thought my life was over, but 
um, I just remember the the resiliency and and the effort it took for me to convince my teachers to let me just just give me a chance, just give me a chance, let me try. Um, if I if I fail, I fail. But you know, if, if I don't, then you know, at least I have a chance to 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 get a college degree or something like that. You know, but uh, make a long story short, I don't want to talk about that too much because that's for a whole other podcast. I want to tell that whole story to be honest with you because that is it's hilarious uh, and tragic and you know, it, it's so many things wrapped up in that story. But I've just always been you know from that day since then. Before that, I never even cared or noticed uh, the underdog or, um, you know, the having to overcome adversity because up until that point, things for me were pretty easy and, you know, not easy in the sense that everything was was handed to me. I didn't have to work for anything because I worked really hard to get where I was, but there was there wasn't much adversity I had to, to overcome being seven feet tall or 6'11 in high school. Um, I pretty much, once I just learned how to walk and chew gum, I could pretty much write my own ticket to most of the universities, uh, in the country. And then when I got there, it was, um, just pretty much being taken care of 100%, uh, by the university, uh, until I left. But at that moment, it was like, all that was about to be over. And (laughs) so when I, when I finished and, you know, I I went back to school, I re-enrolled, and, uh, you know, I passed all my classes from that point on. I just remember uh, talking of, or just noticing now, you know, like the underdog, the David, the David and Goliath stories, the, you know, the overcoming adversity stories. And, um, you know, I, come to, I came to appreciate them. And, and still to this day, uh, it's, it's some of my some of my favorite, um, some of my favorite things to read and, and hear, uh, because, again, like I said, you know, I was seven feet tall. You know, it's, it's not, I don't, nobody really feels sorry for, for me or, you know, because I got injured. So what? You know, a lot of people look at it like, oh, well, you know, athletes get everything anyway, which I totally understand because, I mean, it's some, some things that I got away with that uh, I probably would not have got away with if I was six one. That's for sure. But, um, you know, I, you know, I still have, have an appreciation for it now. But uh, at any rate, let's get to the show. All right, our next guest on the show has got a story, you know, a story of dedication, a story of perseverance, a story of hard work, a story about being against all odds, David against Goliath, uh, <laughs> Rocky Balboa against Apollo Creed, Rudy. Oh, I mean, man. you know, all, all these stories wrapped up in one. And, uh, and, and you get my guy, Mark Gaffari. Mark, what's up, man? Hello, it's great to be on the show. You really talked me up. I got a lot to live up to right now. Hey, man, I, <laughs> I, I'm hype right now. As I was doing your intro. I mean, I was ready to go take on the world right now, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, l- listen, it, it's great, great having you. Um, you know, I know you, you got your very, very busy man and, and, you know, take time out your day, uh, to be on the show with us is, is great. And to help educate, you know, a lot of the, the youngsters and, and a lot of people in general, um, as to, uh, what you do and your story and, and everything. I think it'll be inspiring to, to many individuals out there. So speaking of, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, and, and your journey. And, and, um, obviously most people that, that I have on the show are, are ex basketball players professionally. So we, we know that's the ending or well, actually it's not the ending. It was just like the middle of your story, but we know it's a huge part of it. All right. Yep. So tell everybody a little bit about your basketball journey from, uh, from the start, uh, throughout your professional days. Yeah, and and you know I'm honored to be on the on the the podcast today and, and share and and happy to uh, you know be a part of this for you. So the you know I grew up to two immigrants uh, two immigrants from Lebanon. My father came over to the U.S. when he was 19 years old, didn't speak any English, and was really you know he was fleeing a country where uh, there was civil war and a lot of turmoil going on for the past you know, the previous, I should say, uh, decades. And, you know, he wanted to get a, get a better life for his family. And so he came over here, finished his undergraduate education and, uh, did that in only, in less than three years, then went to medical school and became a doctor and, uh, you know, leader in the community and, um, you know, grew up in Metro Detroit area. That's where he immigrated to. Uh, and that's when, you know, I started to, uh, and my basketball journey started was back when I was five years old playing in the neighborhood, neighborhood club, 
And uh, after that, you know, went to play high school level. I actually was one of the few that didn't play AAU throughout high school. I played soccer and baseball in high school as well. And so I had a different different path than most to uh, to getting to my professional career in Lebanon. And uh, had a good high school career, but went to a really small school. You know, graduated with uh, less than uh, 60 kids in my class. So I, I didn't go to a powerhouse. I didn't go to a school that traditionally, you know, created basketball talent. Uh, but found a way to, uh, you know, I made my own highlight tape and sent it out to, to coaches. And uh, a coach at Kalamazoo College found me and started to recruit me. And uh, that was really when, you know, my uh, my journey on the professional basketball circuit really started. So uh, my last year of high school basketball, I got uh, introduced to a guy named Joe Abunasar, who I know you know, uh, Lowe. And uh, his sister is a small world. His sister was the secretary at my dad's medical practice. So that's how I found out about Joe. And so I uh, was very fortunate and blessed to be able to, to go train at Impact Basketball at the end of my senior year in high school before I went to go play at Kalamazoo College. And uh, that really opened up my eyes to how to train my body, how to train my, my mental IQ uh, for the game. And so uh, that was really my launching period into having a really great career uh, at Kalamazoo College. I was fortunate enough to work my tail off both in the classroom and uh, and on the court to become a two-time academic All-American at Kalamazoo and then uh, signed with you know a mutual agent of yours, Jad Saadi, uh, after my senior year of college. Uh, and then, you know, when I uh, had my senior spring break, went on the trip to Lebanon for 10 days, met with a bunch of teams, I got a few offers and then signed with Riyadi, which is where uh, you and I got to play. Uh, ended up signing a three-year contract, but uh, only ended up playing for a year. Uh, and I'll, I'll share more about that later on the podcast. But had a had a great year in Lebanon. Uh, you know, we got to compete in Greece, Morocco, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. I uh, got to travel, got to win championships, and uh, and had a wonderful time when I was over there uh, from a basketball standpoint. Yeah, you know, and and what I love about the the story first, like I said, I, I mean, I, I love the underdog. Um, story and, and everything, and, which most uh, most Americans do. Uh, you know, we always want to see we 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 love to see a guy win one once or twice, but then when somebody's like constantly win, we don't want to see that. We want to see somebody knock that guy <laughs> off, and that's usually like the guys that went to in our industry. You know, the the non division one schools like we love to hear stories about oh, a guy went didn't go to Duke or UCLA or 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 uh, you know University of Arizona. Uh, they went to Kalamazoo or, you know, and went to a, a high school where it only had a graduating class of about 50 or 60, uh, whatever, you know, like, uh, kids in, in the class. Cause we, we just love to, to see that fight. And, um, you know, like one, one thing I want to talk about is, and there's a lot of guys out there. There's way, there's more guys probably that go to division two, II, division three, NAIA, um, junior college, all of those, then division one. Uh, combined, there's, there's just so many players out there, and there's a lot of good ones too. Um, you know, you made it pro from Division Three. What are some of the negative labels that are attached to the non Division One athletes, and how did you yourself break through those? You know, to realize your your, your college and pro dreams. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think a couple of the you know biggest labels. One, usually you're not athletic enough. That's one of them. Two, uh, you're not tall enough. You're not big enough. Uh, those were some of the, definitely the biggest uh, biggest labels, negative labels that were attached to guys that didn't make it to, to D1. And, and for me, you know, I'm definitely not tall. I'm 5'11 on a good day. Uh, I'm, you know, definitely <laughs> not ath- definitely not athletic, right? Um, hey, but, hey, hey, uh, hey, Mark, when, when you close, when you five eleven, when you close to six feet, you just gotta say six feet, man. I, I got a ton of ton well, of friends that are six feet six <laughs> one, and they're really like five ten, five eleven, man. So just go ahead and say six hey, feet. Hey, the program said six one. Don't worry about I that. I know. But see, I'm telling, the, I'm telling the people the facts. <laughs> um, so for me, the way that I was able to break through those labels were through just continuous hard work uh, to improve my game. So you know, uh, for me, it was shooting and basketball IQ. I felt that if I was never going to be the most athletic guy on the court or the tallest guy, I had to be able to shoot it at a high clip, and then I have to be really, really smart and know the game inside and out. So. Uh, for me, when I broke through, you know, for me with my game, like I mentioned earlier, uh, was that summer at Impact. I got to train, you know, I was training with other high school players, but you look across 
the court to the other or to the other courts and you see NBA guys training, you see how hard they're working and you see how, how much effort they're putting in to just, you know, continue to work on their craft. And these guys are already at the highest level and you see them working day in and day out to make themselves better. And so for me, that's where, where I was really able to break through and, and understand how much work and effort it was going to take to make my game or take my game to the next level. Wow. One, I just want everybody to, to realize the, the message, you know, we're just starting off and you're already dropping knowledge that, you know, you got to work hard. You got to, you got to figure it out. And I had a guy on the show, uh, his name is Darren Phillip. He went to a small school. He went to division one, but it was a small school, Fairfield, Fairfield University in Connecticut. Oh yeah. When he was in high school, he realized, he said, man, if I can just do one thing better than everybody else, if I can create the, the, the niche for myself, you know, like just, this is what I do. Um, you know, like I'll have a much better chance. Right. And, and I'm finding that the, the very smart players are the ones that get far are the ones that kind of realize that at an early age or, or, or at some point in their career before it's done, uh, that they have to, they got to be able to do one thing. And I'm glad that you, that you brought that up, you know, like, yeah, I went to division, you know, I went to a small high school, I went to division three, but if I got a chance, if I can be smarter than everybody else, and if I can just shoot the lights out. Which uh, and and those are those are a couple of things that everybody can improve on. You know, like you you can always be in the gym shooting. If you do that, your shot's gonna get better. You can always watch tons of basketball and learn as much as you you know read tons of basketball books and learn as much as you can, and you can get better. You know, you can get smarter in basketball. So you know, like I, I love that. You know, figure out what you can do early on or what you can do better than anybody else to give yourself a chance to to increase your performance and then maybe go to the next level, right? Right. Couldn't agree more with what you said. And and all of it comes down to discipline, right? It's it's putting a discipline. I mean, people think that shooting is, is uh, you're talented if you can shoot it. But I mean, shooting is just repetition after repetition after repetition, right? It's not like you're born a great shooter. You got to work on it. And so uh, it's actually one of our firm, you know, my, the firm that I'm at, Strategies Wealth Advisors, one of our values, our core values is discipline. And uh, my mentor in, in business, Aaron Valdir, uh, we like to further define what discipline means and just uh, take it to the level and say, be, to be perfect at the things that don't require talent. And so, you know, if, if one piece of advice gets out of this, it's to be disciplined in your craft and, and what you're working on so that you can get that one thing that you're, you've got your niche that you're better at than everybody else. Absolutely. And discipline is what always takes the great ones to the next level, no matter where you start or the good ones to the next level or making the good ones great. Right. And when you're a kid, <laughs> Your basketball dream is to get to the NBA. Everybody NBA. is, is, is Everybody. millions of kids <laughs> out there that are like 10 years old. Like, yeah. And all they're doing is playing in their backyard, imagining themselves with that Bulls jersey on or with that Clippers jersey on or with that uh, that yep. Spurs jersey on. You know, that, that's all of our dreams uh, when we're a kid to to play pro basketball. And, and you actually had an opportunity uh, opportunity to to make it to the pro level. Um, and when you first got there, you know, you, you leave college, you, you get out of high school, you go division one. I'm sure it was like the next level up. You're like, whoa, I got to become more disciplined. I got to work harder. You get out of college, division three, mind you, and you get an opportunity to play pro. And it's like the first time you stepped out on that court as a professional athlete, what were some of the eye opening experiences that made you just say immediately, yeah, this is pro basketball? <laughs> the uh, this is a great question, and I guess I, I should have mentioned one thing earlier when I was talking about my story because I wanted to bring it up in our conversation today for guys that are considering going overseas. Because both my parents were immigrants, uh, I actually have dual citizenship in Lebanon, and so that really helped. You know, as you know, Lo, for teams overseas that can get guys to come over from the U.S. who have a dual citizenship, and for that to not count against their foreign player count is huge. Yes, so it is. I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that because, you know, if you're a guy who has any type of ties to Europe, the Middle East, wherever it is, you know, make sure, make sure you look into that with your family to try and get that citizenship so that, you know, you can uh, make yourself more attractive to, to teams overseas. So, um, you know, in terms of my pro experience, when I first realized this was pro basketball, 
you know, unlike you at Arizona where you're at big game on big game after big stage, you know, and playing in the final four in the championship. Uh, I never had those experiences at D3. And for me, when our first tournament that we played in, in Greece, uh, we got a police escort from the hotel to the gym. So this was actually before the game even started where I was realizing, yeah, this is a different level. And when we had that police escort to, uh, to the gym for our bus, I, it just made me realize that how passionate these fans are for the game uh, at that level, uh, because they care about their country. They care about their cities. They care about their teams, uh, that they're rooting for. And, that, you know, they care so much that they had to have a police escort for, uh, for our team to get to the game safely. So that was probably the first time that I really realized, you know, wow, this is pro basketball. This is different. Um, so for me, that it was that moment. Yeah. And I remember that, uh, that was like preseason too, which was crazy. Uh, it because was preseason. It, yeah, it was preseason, yeah. right? It wasn't like the championship or nothing like that. Like, you know, in, in, in uh, March or April, it was like preseason. Uh, I think we played in our practice jerseys, you know, like we weren't even, uh, you know, like we weren't even <laughs> like all the yep. teams there. And um, yeah, you're right. That was in Greece. And, you know, Greece is a is a, a huge, huge basketball hub for Europe. So, um, yeah, I, I remember that, too. Like it was yesterday. And and, and that's serious. That's serious. Uh, for all the it, guys it out really there, you is. probably won't get police escorts to most of your games. But but <laughs> <laughs> and it actually depends on where you play. But, uh, you know, like that, that that is a yeah, this this is a pro basketball moment for sure, man. So, you know, you, you go you go you play pro basketball. Um, or you, you make it, you, you had that first police escort. You're like, yeah, 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 this, this is pro that this is what it, this is what it is. Um, this is my new life right now. I'm about to play this game for like 10, 15 years, you know, and, and retire with all these championships and medals and all that. And then reality sets in. Talk about that. Yeah. So for, uh, for me, uh, the reason I only played a year, uh, there's a few of them. One, I, I got really homesick, and uh, and also living in the Middle East, in a you know, there's a few things. So I'll talk about the homesickness for a second because I think it's really relevant to guys that are considering going overseas. Uh, and, you know, just a piece of advice is to really just stay stay close to your circle, stay close to your people that you grew up with. Find a way to make it work from a communication standpoint. Obviously, there's going to be different time zones that you're in, and so you can't always communicate at the ideal time. But you have to figure out a way to be, you know, with your people and continue to stay close to your support system. Because uh, when you go pro, too, another thing that makes you realize, yeah, this is pro basketball. Is you know, you're playing with guys who are much older than you that have been doing it for a while. And this is their livelihood, right? Uh, this is how they feed their family. And so it's not like you're playing in college with your boys and, you know, there's not money on the line, right? It's uh, uh, when you're in overseas and you're playing for a paycheck, you're just trying to make sure that, you know, you're, uh, you're just trying to make sure that you're – Sorry, you'll probably have to edit this out. Um, <laughs> hey, we're in, we're not editing lost, nothing out, lost bro. My, lost <laughs> my train of thought. <laughs> no, no, no. That, that's how. Um, it's, look, you're in the office, man. Like I said, you you take you're helping us out. You're taking time out of your busy day, you know, to to, to get some things done for for us and, and you know help to help you know these kids have a better understanding of of life. Well, one coming uh, from where you came from, which is there's a lot of kids going to be coming from, the, you know, like that smaller basketball circle and then making it pro man and going overseas and being 10,000 miles away from home. And that's real. That's something that no one has yet to talk about that I've talked to or interviewed the homesickness. And, and I dealt with that twice in my life where I was like, oh, God, man, like this is uh, I don't know if I can do this. That was the first time I went to, or when I first went to college, I remember, um, you know, cause I started out, I went to Arizona, but I started out at Wake Forest and I remember leaving from, from St. Louis. I went to a small high school myself. Now we were more of a powerhouse. You know, I played with, with mm -hmm. a few all Americans. Right. Um, but still, you know, it was still a small community. Um, you know, I was like a big fish in a small pond, you know, and then I go to Wake Forest, the ACC, obviously. And um, I, was, I just remember that first week of school, man, like I had these calling cards and, and you might be too young to remember this. They, they used to have these cards that you, you could buy for like 50 bucks or, or 25 bucks or 100 bucks. And then when you dial the 1-800 number, then you can just call wherever you want. Man, I went through the, like, I had like five of them. I went through all five of them in like two <laughs> days, bro. It was like five hundred dollars worth of of calling cards, and I and I and I smoked them because I was I was so homesick, you know. And the first time I went uh, to Europe 
when I left the States, I hadn't played out or lived outside of the States till I first went to Lithuania. And, um, you know, I was a little bit homesick uh, being in Lithuania for the first time because I was so far, I was living so far away from home for right. the first time, you know, and, and that that's a great point, man, that a lot of guys are going to have to deal with and you really have to take care of yourself, um, you know, to be in your right mind for that. Yeah, no, couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And then the other, the other piece of advice I'd say is just uh, to find a mentor, right? Whether it's on the court, one of your teammates, whether it's somebody, a coach, or somebody who you trained with, like a guy like Joe Abunasar, just make sure you continue to talk to your mentor about what you're going through because, you're, you know, as you know, the ups and downs of the season, they don't just happen over the course of weeks or months. They happen even within a day, right? You're going to have an up and a down. And so just making sure that you stay close to a mentor as well is so important that you can just bounce ideas off of, get advice, get some feedback on, uh, because they're going to really help guide you through your career. And so you want to make sure you stay close to those mentors who've been through it before. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I thought you were going to mention me as, as one of your mentors, um, you know, for that year. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, hurt. I'm not offended. Obviously, you could pick who you want to be a mentor, <laughs> but I, I thought I gave you a few nuggets, uh, you know, when you were in when you were in Riyadh, man, in Lebanon. But but it's OK. I, I understand, you know, you throw Joe's name out there and then, you know, obviously your dad and you know, stuff like that. That's cool, man. You know, like, like we're, we're, we're still friends. So, you know, don't, don't even worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still, you good, know, man. you're a mentor to me as always, Lo. You know, you're a mentor. Oh my always. God. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. You know, like I, you didn't even have to say my name, but you know, I, I, man, you know what? You're a good guy. You're a good guy, man. But look, you already gave two amazing pieces of advice. Um, and, uh, I, I think so many guys are going to appreciate just hearing that. And like I said, I've never heard anybody say, um, you know, you have to be prepared to be homesick or even mention it. You know, a lot of guys are all tough and stuff like that. And they, they don't want to uh, right. ever, you know, it's, there's no emotion. It's all, oh, yeah, you know, everything is just grit. And, and I just, I crushed everything and, and, and that's it. Anything in my way, I just annihilated it. And, you know, I mean, you know, guys have real feelings. Right. You know, guys have things that they're going through, especially when you when you go when you get dropped off sometimes in the middle of a country and a lot of people. Lebanon's a little bit different. It's a smaller country. It's very westernized. Right. People are extremely friendly. Like, I mean, everywhere you go, I went like all over Lebanon, Lebanon, where I was, um, you know, people were just uh, welcoming and inviting, uh, with the exception of when it was around arrival game time. Then, you know, people weren't the right. best at that moment. But for the most part. Uh, everybody was was uh you know like they, they treated you like uh, like family everybody you right. know so and, and and I love that but you know you get you gave so much advice you know is there anything else that you would tell any of these guys you know right before they get on their their that first plane uh, to go overseas and start their their pro career oh man that's a great great question you know staying close to your circle staying close to a mentor those are the two big ones. I guess the third one that I would say is just, um, you know, just continue to find a way to, uh, you got to have something that motivates you. Right. And so if you can set yourself goals, whether it's a daily goal or a monthly goal, whatever the cadence is, just try and continue to set yourself goals to continue to get better, whether it's making your teammates better, better, whether it's becoming a mentor to a younger guy, um, you know, set yourself a goal, uh, it's not just for the young guys going overseas, but uh, for the first time, but anybody who's going overseas is just to continue to set yourself goals uh, because, you know, seasons are much longer overseas than they were in college. And so you need to continue to have something that you're striving forward to, uh, you know, whereas in college, you know, when uh, the games are, you know, when your practices are, it's very regimented uh, overseas. You still know when your games and practices are, but it's a little scattered out, right? But the season's much longer. You got a lot to work for. And so I would just say, find a way to set yourself some goals uh, so that you continue to stay motivated and stay hungry when you're playing overseas. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And and uh, one thing you said earlier, actually, you gave your company a plug. I love that. You know, guys have been doing <laughs> that lately, um, you know, and, and I love it. I, I want you to do that because it also um, helps these young guys to understand and and, and all all players. And, and, and let me just tell you right now, like I, I was a guy in my career, I never thought about life after basketball until it was at the very end. Right. You know, cause to me, like my life, my life was basketball. There was no life after, uh, when I, when I first started now, obviously I made a mistake. If I could go back and change that, I would have started some things a little bit earlier, but you know, my focus was always basketball number one. But, um, what I love about, 
uh, a lot of the guys I've have, have on the show now, they've had they've transitioned into that next phase of their life. And, you know, whether it be seamless or not, they're fully immersed in it now and they're doing well. And uh, I know a little bit about what you got going on, but let everybody else know uh, a little bit about this company that you just plugged earlier, man. I, I guess you, you can go ahead and throw yeah. the, e- the email and the website address out there, too, yeah. if you want to. <laughs> hey, guys, sign yeah, it up. I love it. <laughs> so uh, I'm, at, I'm at Strategies Wealth Advisors. Uh, it's a boutique uh, financial advising firm uh, based in, uh, in in the Midwest, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We've got an office in Chicago, too. Uh, we've got clients all over the country. And, uh, you know, if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, you can reach me on my we- on the website at Strategies Wealth. Uh, dot com uh, or my email address mark at strategieswealth dot com. So um, yeah, it's great. Love what I'm doing. I've been doing it for almost five years now, and uh, I've had a great time helping people out with their financial plans and uh, and investment. So uh, yeah, that's what we've got going on now. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And and that's one thing I, that I can can't stress enough to anyone out there. Forget about athletes, forget about, you know, entertainers or guys that come in, people, you know, men, women that come into a large amount of money in a very short amount of time. I'm talking about anybody out there. If you're making money, you know, thinking about your financial future is never too late. And, you know, you want to start as early as possible. I would say, Mark, probably the first the first paycheck you get is probably when you want to start thinking about, um, you know, like your life after and, and planning, um, you know, and, and the responsibility that you have uh, monetarily speaking, correct? That's a great point. Exactly. I mean, that first paycheck, that's when your habits start to form, right? Just like you have your habits in practice and your habits in how you wake up and your daily routines, financial, your financial picture is no different. You have financial habits. Uh, and as soon as that first paycheck comes in, you want to start creating positive, strong habits. Uh, so I couldn't agree more with what you said there. I love it, man. Hey, everybody reach out to this man, you know, like he, he knows what he's doing and, and, and I haven't heard. <laughs> I, I I trust him. I would give him a million dollars, you know, to manage it. I, I'm vouching for him right now, you know. So 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 talk to him, reach out to him if you got any questions, man. Oh, and speaking of, how do we find you on social media? Yeah, I'm on. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. I'm on all three. Just look up my name, Mark Gafari. Last name spelled G H A F A R I. There's not too many of us around the world, so you should be able to find me. Mark, I love it, man. Hey, listen, uh, give give my best to the family. Um, I love that, uh, you know, that, that financial planning career is going well, definitely, definitely, um, stay in touch, stay in contact and just like everybody, just like myself, I'm sure everybody out there is, is very, very happy or very inspired to hear your story. And they should, and we're, they're very fortunate as am I to be able to, to, to have you, um, you know, Give us as much knowledge as possible and a lot of things that will definitely help the youth, um, you know, middle aged people, older people. And through all walks of life, we're not just talking about basketball. We're talking about, uh, you know, the, the full circle of life. Thank you. Yeah. Th- no, thank you Lo, for having me. It's been an honor and a, and a pleasure to be on here. All right. Now, well, there you have it. Um, you got my guy, Mark, who. Like I said, I, his story is I, I love it. For two reasons. One, because, you know, I, I come from a small high school, um, a bigger city. You know, I don't come from like a town of 5,000 people and uh, just with one school and then my whole school is like 80 people or something. Not, not like that. But I do come from a small high school, a small Catholic high school in St. Louis. And um, we I was very fortunate to be able to play with and alongside of some great players and have a really uh, great mentor as a coach uh, who tried to, to teach us and instill in us uh, good work ethic and, and the, the, you know, the power of positive thinking and, and all these things associated with success. So um, I was very blessed and fortunate in that regard. Uh, but still just to be able to make it no matter who you are, where you come from, it's tough, but to be able to make it like how Mark did where, you know, he comes from a super small high school, didn't get recruited, you know, being six feet tall or 5'11 or whatever coming out of high school. Um, then going to a super small division three college, you know, 1500 people in his college. You know what I mean? Like a uh, super small college to to work in his tail off all the way to the end and then getting a pro deal, you know, getting a, 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 
a three-year professional contract to play uh, professional basketball overseas. And, and he, you know, he went to one of the top teams. He was my teammate. And we, were, we were the best team uh, in the league at that time. And he had a, you know, he was on that team right out of, right out of school. So, I mean, just imagine that um, to be able to accomplish something like that. Now, uh, quick, quick, uh, very, very quick career uh, uh, injury uh, limited his, his uh, playing situation. But nonetheless, you, you look at the story and you just look back on his life and what he was able to accomplish. It was um, nothing short of amazing. So um, definitely, uh, you know, overcoming adversity. I don't know if I mentioned the second thing. The second thing is, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, you know, overcoming adversity and and having that killer work ethic can pretty much get you a shot. It can get you on the radar. It can get you a look or get people paying attention to what you're doing. Because like I said to him, you know, I would much rather take somebody who works super, super hard and doesn't have the talent compared to somebody who has the talent but doesn't work super hard. You know, give give me the guy that works super hard with no talent talent any day. Now, what I really want on my squad is somebody who has tremendous talent and tremendous work ethic. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, man. Uh, you know, Mark's got a great story, and there's so many others out there like it. Um, you know, so. Hopefully you learned something today. Well, do me a favor. If you like the podcast, uh, please share it uh, to anybody you think might benefit from it. Uh, If you got any questions, you can always hit me up on my uh, personal uh, social media stuff. That's Mr. Lauren Woods on Twitter and IG. And or you can hit me up uh, on I-N-G-L-L-O underscore U-S on um, IG and Twitter. And that's the Mglow Market Connect Play. That's uh, that's the Mglow uh, social media. So uh, you know, if, if you want to hear something, you want to know something, you you, you don't you don't understand something, um, you know, just reach out. Let me know, man. I, I'd love to uh, you know give my my knowledge and share my knowledge, and, and you know, hopefully it helps helps people out there. Uh, other than that, y'all stay fortunate and be blessed. I'll take days off to watch. When my number is called, I don't take plays off, do I? Do I? I'ma always give you 20 and 10. No matter how much you wanna pretend that I ain't clutch with it. I don't do the low management, maybe I can handle it. When the heat is on, I can manage it. I'm kinda like James Harden's career. I can walk whenever I feel.